Welcome to part two of reliability of measurements, looking at our data. Again, we're starting at packet page 24, so let's take a look at here. Now here's an example of some data. This is the same data we looked at in part one. And in looking at our data, we can see our beaker people's results, and we see our cylinder people's results. Now we saw that our cylinder had much better precision. However, even in looking at this, we noticed that one of those data sets, that number there, that's just kind of way out there from the rest of them. You know, we got 100, 101, 0.97. Those three are all really, really close together. But the 1.13, mm, that just doesn't look right. And we might be thinking, man, I think we just messed up on this. Now, our mathematical sense might tell us, well, let's just let's just ignore that number. Let's just throw that number away because obviously something went wrong. But we need to be careful uh, in doing that. Now it's okay to think that and to be analyze that. But as scientists, we got to be really careful with data. You never want to fudge your data, uh, nor do you ever want to just throw out something just because it looks wrong. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you have to keep all data. If you know you made an error, and if you know the data is wrong, then yes, you get rid of it and you do it over again. If you know you were doing your experiment and you spilled some of your sample, or realized uh, in the middle of something that, oh, we, we measured this wrong, then yes, you stop, you scrap it, and you start again. But we're talking about situations here where everything looks on the up and up. You did your measurements, you did your calculations, and you have your answer, and it just looks wrong. Well, uh, one thing you can do is uh, do a statistical test to see if this fluctuation is just maybe a result of randomness or if the fluctuation is so far out there that is, it is statistically probable that it is the result of an error. Now there's a whole bunch of tests you can do on this and if you get into a problem stats class you really dig into this but one fairly simple test is called a Q test and really that's what the test does. It kinda just goes to see is it statistically probable that it was a result of an error or is it just due to the randomness, the fluctuation of measurements and guessing and things like that. Um, it's kinda like if you were flipping a coin, if I was flipping a quarter, you know, I have a 50% chance that I'm going to get heads. Um, so I might expect to get heads 5 out of 10 times. I wouldn't be surprised if I got heads 6 out of 10 times, nor would I probably be surprised if I got heads 7 out of 10 times, because that's within the realm of the randomness of the flipping the coin. But if I, if I flip that coin and I got heads 10 out of 10 times, and I might start thinking, mm, this is highly improbable, and I probably want to look at that coin. It's probably a two-headed coin or something fishy is going on. So that's really what the Q test does. Is this so improbable that you probably goofed, and then you can throw your data away, or is this just within the realm of normal randomness? So here's the way it works. Here's the formula. The outlier refers to your data set that's in question. The outlier is the data set that looks wrong. And then you subtract from that the value closest to it. Okay, and then this is going to be divided by essentially your range, which is your highest value minus your lowest value. And when you plug all your values into this formula, you're going to get what's called a Q value. And once you have a Q value, then you're going to look it up on a table. We're going to give you that in a slide or two here, which is called a critical Q value. And that's going to tell you, that comparison is going to tell you whether or not you can throw your results away. Again, the best way to explain this is just to take a look at an example. So um, the table that I'm going to show you is what's called a 90% confidence table. In other words, if it, if it does match up here, we can throw it away with a 90% confidence that it probably was a result of a goof, of an error, and not just a, a reasonable randomness fluctuation. So here's our example that we'll look at. Um, again, here's our four trials, and just taking a minute looking at this, we can see there's one data set trial two there is obviously that's kind of way out there so our instinct would be eh, let's just throw that result out but we don't want to just haphazardly do that 
we need to statistically prove that we can throw that away. So we'll run the Q test on that guy. So our outlier is the 23.5, and from that we'll subtract the closest value, which was the 28.2. Again, notice that we're interested in the absolute value of these differences, so always just make your results positive. And then I'm going to divide that by my range, which is going to always include your outlier. In this case, we have our 23.5. That's our low value in this case. And our high value is the 29.1. So when we do the math here, we get a Q value of 0.839. OK, now that alone doesn't tell us anything. But what we have to do is we have to look it up on the critical Q value chart. So here's the critical Q value chart. Now notice we have various different critical Q values. Now, which one we use depends on how many trials that we did. In this example, we had four trials. So if you have four trials, then the critical Q value that you use is 0.76. So now that I know my critical Q value is 0.76, I go and I compare that to my actual Q value. So in this case, we got 0.839, which is our actual Q value, which was bigger than that critical value that we just looked up on the chart of 0.76. So whenever your Q value is bigger than the critical Q value, that means yes, you can throw out your results with a 90% confidence that it's a result of a goof and not just a random fluctuation. Now you notice on that chart that we looked at that the critical Q values depend on the trials. And the more trials that you do, the lower your critical Q value has to be. And, and that kind of stands to reason, because the more times we do it, if I get very, very consistent results, uh, and I get one result that's out there, there's a better chance that, yes, I can throw it away. So sometimes what I'll have people do, if you only did three trials or four trials, and it comes out that, well, you can't throw it away, maybe do a few more trials, and then look at your critical Q value again. Uh, if you're consistent with your other answers, then you might have a chance of throwing that out after that time. But really, that's what the Q test is, comparing your Q value with the critical Q. If it's bigger, you can throw it away. And then as a result, we can feel confident that we can do that. Now, in our results that we've been looking at, we had that one group, that one data, um, that 1.13. And we're a little curious, can we throw this away or not? So I want you to go ahead. And uh, I'm just going to end the video now. Go ahead and do the Q test using just the cylinder people information and see if we can throw that result out and we'll talk about our answer in class the next day. Have fun.